So we can start then. Any questions with an exercise or anything from before? Um, so let's see one, fifth, one person on Zoom. So, okay, today we're going to start uh, a new chapter. It's chapter five on canonical modules. Um, and F injectivity. At least a first um, look at that. If we have time, we're going to come back to it and study it properly and very hard, but I doubt we have time unless you insist and want to take a second curtain in the fall. Um, uh, but okay, so. The point is to talk about canonical modules. Uh, it's very hard. Uh, uh, well, so it, it is. It is. It's a very, very important thing, and uh, you could argue it is the most important object uh, in commutative algebra. I'm not even kidding. So it's it's really that important. I think the name, it's, it's a bad name because it's not very canonical, we'll see. But I suppose the name is also to emphasize how important it is. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's what the topic is all about in, in a certain way. And I'll try to emphasize that. So unfortunately, the canonical module is not so easy to define. So there is a price to pay for the glory of working with the canonical much. Okay. So, so let's try to understand what this is. Okay. So the point is that to a reasonable ring, we are going to associate a so-called canonical module omega r. Um, We'll see again that it's not so canonical. What is canonical is the so-called canonical class. It's the divisor class of, of this thing. Um, so this is not possible to do for all rings. We will see that what we want for this uh, is R to be a, a finite algebra over a ring R G. And this ring has to be Gorenstein. And this is where Gorenstein comes in to make this possible. So R has to be a finite uh, G algebra, meaning that R is, is, is a G algebra that is finally generated as a G module. OK? So G algebra, where G is Gorenstein, And we also need actually that the dimension of G is finite. Uh, of course, everything here is in Ethereum. Uh, and so another technical hypothesis over there for this to be possible is that G has to be epidimensional. Um, this means that when you look at the minimal primes of, of, of R, they all have the same dimension, you know, like the portion has the same dimension. Geometrically, the reducible components have all the same dimension. Uh, this is very mild because very often in, when you work with this thing, you assume that R is Kohemacoli. And maybe you have heard that Kohemacoli rings have this unmixed property. Actually, that's the characterization of them. Historically, actually, the Kohemacoli property, at least by Macaulay, was introduced to prove that the polynomial ring is unmixed. Meaning that when you look at any idea that is cut out by a regular sequence, the, the minimal price will have the same height and so on. In particular, chemical rings are equidimensional. So this is, this is very mild, let's say. Uh, but the, the real hypothesis is this, that R has to be a finite algebra over a Gorenstein ring, uh, which is very mild for purposes thanks to uh, we'll see it thanks to the theorem of Gabb, right? Because, for example, if finite rings are portions of regular rings of finite dimension, and well, regular rings are Gorenstein, and therefore a finite ring satisfies this automatically. 
or by the cohen structure theorems, complete rings satisfy this. So if you're working with pure singularities, meaning complete local rings, you end up in this setup anyways. So, but, so the point of Gorenstein rings uh, is that they let you cook up this object. Okay? So the first thing we need to do is to, uh, to study a little bit of, of um, Gorenstein rings. Okay? So this is for the existence. Okay? So this is for the existence. The existence is equivalent to, to this setup. Okay? Uh, so it, it, it actually was very well known that if you have this setup, you can cook up the canonical module. But it was an open problem actually until 2002. Uh, it was called Sharpe's conjecture uh, that you know the converse was true. Like if you have a canonical module, technically speaking, a dualizing complex, which I haven't mentioned, but uh, no, a yes, yeah, dualizing complex. The existence of such a thing implies that you have to be a finite algebra of Gorenstein rings. So that's the role of Gorenstein rings uh, for this. Okay, so. Uh, and but what is that? You know what? What are we looking for? What are we looking for? What is the deal with omega r? Omega r. Um, what we want to fit is that it is a local property. Actually, what we want is okay. We, we take omega r. And we localize it at the P. So we, we could well call this omega r. So omega r, when you localize, it becomes a canonical module of the local range. Okay? And what we want about this is that essentially, at least when you complete, that it is matlis dual to the top local cohomology module. So what we want is that. When we compute the matlis dual of omega rp, remember this is Hong over rp. You take the injective pole of the residue field that I'm just going to call E into omega rp. And what we want is this to be uh, equal to certain cohomology module. Uh, we can call it uh, local cohomology of R at P. And here you want the top one. We'll see that the top one essentially means that you take the height of P, which is the same thing, you know, as the dimension of RP. Right? So height of P is equal to the dimension of RP. This is, this is what I'm talking here about the top local homology. Um, and so this is what you're looking for. You're looking for an object that locally is matlis dual to the top local cohomology module. So here, I, uh, you know, talking about matlis dual properly, we have to complete, right? But we have seen that, well, actually, we'll see that this object equals, uh, you know, the, it's, 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 it's the same thing as computed in the, in the conclusion. Okay. So even if you get it just, just locally, automatically, you get it for the completion. That's, that's the point I'm, I'm trying to make here. Okay? And so this is what you want. So technically speaking, if you want, you can say that you can complete this thing. Right? That's what I'm doing here. I'm completing it. And you can call it the canonical module of the complete local range. And this thing is the matrix dual of the top local cohomology module. That's the goal. Um, we're looking for such a thing. Um, so, and I hope that as we keep talking about this, it starts to make sense that this is something you want to do. Okay. So this, but this, so the weird thing is that this guy would be the conceptual object, this canonical model, and it's. Matlis counterpart would be this local cohomology module, which you can think more of a computational tool. Okay, local cohomology is a tool to make computations. 
is by excellence, you know, the computational tool in our department. You know, that's, that's the, how growth is ambition, you know, like this is the tool to get things done, okay? And everything in our department, you know, boils down to some cohomology theory, it has to, that's, that's the spirit, okay? So, is the goal more or less clear, even if it looks like, eh, okay. <laughs> but it's, uh, so we'll see, we'll see, we'll see why this matters, little by little, okay? Um, at least, but it's important to have a goal in mind, which is this duality. Uh, so we'll see that, as, as I put it here, this object, and so, and so whatever object give, that gives you this is going to be economical much, okay? The, a, a canonical module. So you, you may ask about the unique, how canonical this is. Well, you will see right away that, well, so if, so according to this definition, if omega r is a canonical module, meaning that it has this property, then so is omega r tensor any other R module uh, for all, let's say, invertible R module. So here, invertible means, means the following. This means projective. By the way, everything is finally generated, right? So, so we're looking for omega R has to be finally generated. That's part of the, the thing. And here, that means. Uh, uh, projected final generator, meaning like locally free of rank one. So the point is that you see that what you want is that when you localize L of P, this is isomorphic to RP. So it's locally free of rank one. And that goes by the name of the uh, Right, you see that because if you localize that, then you get to make RP that has a property you want, it's a local property. And LP becomes RP. And so when you tensor it, it goes away. So automatically it has a property. So you see that the uniqueness cannot be guaranteed because you can do that. However, that's all that can go wrong. So any other canonical module will be fair by twisting by an invertible module. So at least if you're really local, all canonical modules are isomorphic. And so they are a little bit canonical. They, they are not so canonical because they are not unique up to unique isomorphism. They're just isomorphic. Okay? So, uh, yeah, so, but this is all can happen. But this is all can happen. Okay? Um, we're going to get into more details. I'm just, I'm just giving you a rough um, tour of, of what this is. Uh, what else should we say? So one of one of the issues why we cannot talk about this properly in this course is because the proper language to talk about this is the right categories, and uh, it's a topic you may have not studied yet, and so we don't have the right language to speak about these things. But it's okay, we don't, we don't need that. We can just take a few things in the black box. But just let me make us a remark that the, that the truly important object here that you may have here is the so-called dualizing complex. So this is the dualizing complex. So this object, as the name suggests, it's not a module, it's a, it's a complex. It lives in certain derived category of R, of R modules. And all I have said, so if you go and look at the theory, all the theory surrounds the dualizing complex. And the canonical module happens to be the cohomology in the three dimensional R of that thing. Uh, in particular, you see that why for this you need to be a number. You need to you, you need R to have finite dimension. Okay, so what, what I want to say is that there is a much more general thing: the dualizing complex, 
and it exists for, for this uh, finite algebra, so recognition rings, and so on. And the, the, the canonical module is just certain cohomology module of that complex. Okay? So this is this is why to develop the theory is a little bit hard because the theory has been written around this object and the right categories and so on. And one just extracts this object out of it. Okay. Um, so and so the point uh, uh, so the point is that uh, the canonical module comes with certain Cartier operator. And this is what we want for this course. We'll see that certain thing called ground individuality, at least if R is a finite, uh, and you need R to be a finite. And this is one of the key points in which a finite that is absolutely essential. And for this, you need to two types of hypothesis. Usually, people assume that R is local. Is this enough? Or that R is uh, essentially a finite type. Uh, so these are the two setups of algebra geometry that matters. So that's why people are very happy just with this. So if you're in one of these setups, then what you get is a Cartier operator. So you get a map, kappa, let me call it R, D, Goes from the Frobenius push forward the canonical module to omega r. And this becomes, in a sense, the canonical Cartier one. Okay, and the theory of M singularities is about that. And I don't, I'm not exaggerating. And that's, that's the point I want to set up. Everything surrounds this structure. So more generally, we'll see that whenever you have a module with, with a map that goes like this, it's referred to as a Cartier module. And that's the good way in, uh, that you have to write a theory. So all possible splitting, we will see that the source, in a sense, comes from here. And yeah, so. So the point is that the theory is here, okay? And so I want to illustrate this point at the very least, trying to, to, to give you the definition of injectivity and how it compares to impurity. And we'll see that the nice way to understand that is here, okay? So for example, for example, let me give you a sample of what type of theorems we want to have. Uh, so suppose that R is as above in the sense that it has a canonical module. Um, so admitting, or, sorry, not, not just a canonical module, but a Cartier operator. And say Kohemakoli, we see that Kohemakoli is very important. In this setup. Um, and uh, let me say either, let me put two more hypotheses either complete or normal. And I, and, I, and I want to make this emphasis here. Look at this hypothesis. This is something we haven't talked about yet, but we have to. And this Kohama Kohli hypothesis too. Kohama Kohli plus normal or complete, either one, are the, the truth uh, basic hypothesis for everything to work out. This is, this is a natural, so to, so to speak, uh, uh, basic setup for singularity here. Could my colleague was normal. And you will see that a lot if you open any paper. You assume that the ring is my colleague, no, no, my colleague, no, no, my colleague, no. <laughs> and so on. That's the very basic, okay? So I want to illustrate uh, a little theory that, that shows these two hypotheses playing an absolutely amazing role here. And it's that, uh, so you have this then, R is a pure, if and only if, 
this kappa r is split. And then you will see that r in this particular setup is f injective. This is not a definition of f injective, but in this particular setup implies that this kappa r e is injective. So it lets you compare very nicely the difference between these two notions of F singularities. If purity and injectivity, they become transparent if you look at the, the Cartier operator. If purity has to do about the Cartier operator is splitting, you know, meeting a, a section, it might go in the other way. But the injectivity, you may argue, is more natural because it's about a sort of theory, it's way weaker. You see, some of it's split, it is rejected for sure. But if it is rejected, it's not a split, unless the canonical module is rejected. And that's the Cartier conditions, which are specific the Gorenkian condition, and so on. So you see, the Cartier operator, in a, in a sense, illustrates or clarifies how what F singularities are all about. Okay? So, and, and also to give you something very satisfying because. If you use the language of Cartier module, you see that the F injectivity is none other than the F purity of the canonical Cartier module. So F injectivity is another notion of the purity, the one for the canonical structure. Okay, so everything is conceptually very satisfying if you work with this object. But there's a, 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 a price to pay. That defining this uh, it's 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 pain. It's a lot of advanced stuff. Okay. And to do it properly, we have to get to the right categories, the, the dualizing complex, and so on. But we're gonna take a few shortcuts and see how much we can do without having to get into that. But at the very least, we need to properly talk about local cohomology, and also we need to talk about cohemocolons in Gorish and Wings. Okay. Is the fractionality also characterized by two property on the yes this and that's the right way to think about it. The irrationality is the f regularity of the canonical structure in the same way. So the point is like there are four main classes of singularities: the purity, the injectivity, and regularity, and rationality. But actually, what this uh, um, approach says is that there is only two: a purity and a regularity. Because the rationality of injectivity are a purity and a regularity for the, the canonical module. Yeah. So that's something we will see. Mm -hmm. um, so traditionally, uh, the definition of F injectivity and F rationality are given in terms of, of local homology. But I don't think that's correct. Well, it's correct because it's, it's equivalent. <laughs> but conceptually speaking, uh, you, are, you are sort of telling me how you, have, you compute it. Not what it is. But to tell what it is properly, I think you have to use it on the one. Okay. Um, okay. So yeah, my point, my point of view is that you know, like uh, in, in this month's duality, we will see that uh, local cohomology lives on the Arginian side rather than in the Ethereum side. And I can tell you that the side is the conceptual one. Right? The Archean one is like oh, local homology and things like that, but that's, that's how you do the computations. That's, that's the way I see it. Um, okay, so that's the motivation. That's what we want to where we want to get. I want to get to this thing. Okay. Um, so, and the first thing to get there and, and to get to these type of theories. But the first thing to do is, is to talk about local cohomology, uh, which is not a standard topic in commutative algebra and basic commutative algebra. Like if you take a course in commutative algebra, it's not just like, like that, and you see local cohomology. Maybe if you take two courses or three. <laughs> so, but let's, let's, uh, Make a recap or a quick overview of, of, of how this works. Um, so, section 5.1 uh, local cohomology.
So it's the basic cosmology here of cohesive algebra. Um, so, and actually, let us start with the so-called form term of sections that we have been using actually quite a bit. Now I regret not making this more explicit before, but this is gamma. This gamma form term is kind of trivial. But it's, it's only trivial in community algebra. In, in more general setups of the right geometry, it's not trivial. Uh, but it's this functor. So why is this functor trivial? So look at what it does. You remember that we've done this a few times, right? When we say, okay, let me compute what this is for our module M. And what do we say right away? That this is just M. But the right way to, to, to say this is that this functor is naturally isomorphic to the identity. So the identity on the category of more modules is naturally isomorphic to gamma. Right? So the point is that there is a there is a there is a natural map from here to here that just happened to be an isomorphism which, which takes M and sends it to the map that sends if you want one to M, right? To define a map here, all you have to do is to say where one goes. It's a choice of an element here. Right? And so this is this is the thing. So in the affine setting, that's that's what uh, you know, like Hartram would say, for example, this functor is, is, is very trivial because since it is like that, it is it is it is exact. If you take an exact sequence, you apply this module, you get an exact sequence because it's the identity functor, right? So this is exact. But you know what I mean? Uh, if you take gamma of it, it's exact. It's a pretty trivial form, very possible, nothing interesting. Okay? But that only happens in the affine setting. So to make it more interesting, we have to take support. So we're going to take a, a little uh, alteration of this functor, which is taking support. Um, so support. So we're going to take uh, the functor of sections with support. That's what you need to make this not fail. Okay, and so it has to be with support somewhere, and that somewhere has to be a closed uh, subspace or subset uh, of the spectrum of R. So in other words, you have to take an ideal, but everything we're gonna say is, it depends on, on the closed subset defined by A. So in particular, you can take any radical, uh, sorry, uh, any other idea that coincides with A up to radical, for example, a radical of A. Remember that this thing here is just a set of P's such that A is containing P, right? And so this is a closed, uh, it's a risky closed subset of this. So what we're gonna do is take a new functor, gamma, a blank. Okay. Uh, so let's let's look at the functor we had before. I guess blank. Right? This is a functor of sections. We want a, a functor of sections with support. With support here or with support in A, it doesn't matter. So what we do is that first of all, we're gonna push and buy A to some power, okay? We're gonna look at maps from here to here. And then we take the limits. Uh, this is a, an, an, an injective limit over M. Right, this this quotient here for my projective system. Um, uh, yeah, projective system. Uh, oh wait, uh, 
Am I getting the arrow in the wrong way? But I think the arrow goes this way. Um, because it's, it's a union. Uh, I'm confused. Um, so you have R. R modulo A, R modulo A squared. And so on. But then if you hum, oh yeah, 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 if you hum into something, then the arrows are reversed. And then the, the arrows get reversed, and so this forms, yeah. Sorry. So so this is this functor. And this is the so-called functor of sections with support in A. So let's see what it is, why, why it has this name. Uh, it's also called the torsion functor. Let's see why. A torsion functor. What is this thing? So let's compute what it is for some A. Sorry, for some M. So notice that this limit here becomes a union because when we plug in U M, again, this, this module is still cyclic, right? So all you have to do is to choose where one goes, but you have to do it in such a well, in such a way that it's compatible with this question. So you have to choose in such a way that it's killed by A to the N. Right? And so the limit becomes a union. And then this thing is naturally isomorphic, if you want. I really call it because we're not, but let's say it's naturally isomorphic to this other thing. Uh, uh, and so here you can say that the support of N is inside the whole plane. This is the geometric description. I say this is the right description, this is the geometric one. The support here of N are those prime ideals such that N at that prime ideal is not zero. In the in the in the in the, the scheme, right? Like uh, N is supposed to represent the shift and N is going to be a local section. And you want the, the support of that section to be inside certain close subsets. Um, uh, yeah, so this is just to illustrate that why this has a name. Functor of section with support somewhere. Geometric thing. However, if you look at this algebraic description, you see why this functor is also called the, the, the A torsion functor or functor of A torsion because you're looking for the ends so that they're, they're killing by powers of A. And that's called having A torsion. Not, not A torsion, but like A torsion. A portion. So you will see that an element M, very often people say it has a portion, it belongs there. If it is killed by some power of A. Um, and so here's an exercise. This functor here is left. Ah, one more point. This also illustrates why this, this functor here only depends on A up to radical, okay? So we will have taken A to be radical, but from time we just don't. Okay, gamma A is left exact. It's left exact. And well, it is, it is, it is covariant. So meaning that, you know what this means, right? Like if you have an exact sequence, when you apply the functor, then you get an exact sequence like this. This is fine, but then you lose selectivity. Okay. And that's the whole point. Uh, 
So if, if you have uh, if you have a quotient here, it's not possible to lift section, right? Like what, what does it mean? Like if you have a section of MW prime with support in A, there is no reason for you to be able to lift it to a section here with support in A. But I'm gonna let you do that as an exercise. And so what happened when you have such a pointer? What do you do automatically? What form of lesson do you want to do? Exactly, to compute the derived functors. So the derived functors are going to let you continue right, to fill in. Yeah. That's what you do. Uh, and so, so in particular, that gives you the ith local cohomology functor. So B add the right functor of gamma A is the local homology functor is the same. Uh, is the I the local homology. Functor, uh, let's say, or let's just say with support. You know why it's happy to say on A? In A? On A. It should be on the variety of A, but this is where generic isn't algebraic language, let's just put it like that. Okay, so. So how you do this in practice, right? Uh, remember, just real quick, recall. Of course, there's a whole theory about it, right? But uh, the point is like the way you compute this is that you take your module and, and you compute an injective resolution. Right? Injective resolution. Well, we've been talking about X and Tor a lot today, right? So in principle, I'm assuming that you're familiar with the formulas of taking an injective resolution. Take the cohomology of that, right? So, injective resolution and then you apply, well, you, you remove M, right? And then you get a complex, which is like this. And then you apply gamma. Gamma A to this. And in principle, since gamma A is not exact, this injective resolution, by definition, is exact. It's an exact complex, right? You apply gamma A and you lose exactness. And the cohomology you get there is the local cohomology. Right? So you have this complex. To that complex, you can extract the homology, right? And that cohomology is this thing, right? And you would say, well, maybe that depends on the injective resolution, right? But the principle is to the class on homological algebra where we saw that two injective resolutions are connected in a certain economic way up to what is the name? Homotopy and then having the same homology and so on. But it's it's just basic algebra in a certain way. Um, that I hope you know. But yeah, so this is this is a certain way how you compute, right? Uh, of course no one computes it like that. Uh, it's just to define it. But the main point of it, the main point, is that it lets you fill in the lack of exactness of gamma A, right? So now what you can do, uh, whenever you have a short exact sequence, right? It's the now you write zero gamma A and prime gamma A and gamma A. And double prime, and then there would be a snake lemma type thing that lets you fill this in with the uh, H1 of M prime. H1 of M, H1 of M double prime. And then another uh, snake lemma thingy, these things are called delta functor, right? Two disconnecting things. And so on. And that's the point. That's, that's the full point, really. Uh, to fill this in. Okay, and so it goes on. 
and so on. Right? Um, and as any good cohomology pointer, it has to be an X of some type. Uh, I've never seen a cohomology pointer that is not the thumbs of sort of X in this class. But let's say, okay, I just, I only know how to compute next. Uh, don't ask me for more. Well, that's fine because this is X. It's just in disguise. So notice by the way it's defined that this thing equals the following functor. It's a, it's a limit, the whole limit uh, of X. All you need to do is to compute this x in here and take the limit. So that's very often, actually, sorry, that's very useful all the time. Uh, whenever I want to prove something about local homology, I just do that. It's, uh, it just helps a lot because the limit is great, and x is super well understood. Um, it's also a lot of nice. Um, so a few remarks, I already said this, uh, local cohomology is invariant up to radical. Again, it's an invariant of the close of set, it's not of a, um, well, this is also very general, but this is useful. I'm gonna make this remark now, but we're gonna use it later. If you apply gamma A to HAI, but the point is that, uh, oh, I should put the name, I guess, here. The point is that uh, this, this, these functors uh, are a torsion. The, the elements here are a torsion. If you take an element of local cohomology, you can bet that you can kill it by a to the n. And that's the geeky you deserve to in this way. It's, 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 it has very little support. It's kill a lot. So, h a i n. Okay. In other words, local cohomology functors or local cohomology modules are a torsion. They are killed. Every, every single element is killed by a power of a. We're going to use that, for example, to prove that very large, but it's going to um, um, Okay, that's it. That's local cohomology. Well, there is a lot of story behind it because people have studied a lot, but that's it. There is no reason to be scared of it or anything or text like that. Um, however, you may wonder how to compute it. Uh, I don't know much about that. I, uh, for me, it's work to actually have to compute a local cohomology model. Uh, but you may have to compute it sometimes. And so the main way to compute it that I know of is through the check complex. The check complex is also cool because it also tells you what local cohomology is about. It's about gluing sections locally into global sections and the obstructions to do that. Um, Was that behavior like generalizing to instead of like using H0, using HJ, and the result be I plus J? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that would be a spectral sequence about that. Uh, and so uh, I think if you want to generalize this beyond that, you have a more complicated thing in terms of spectral sequences, but I, I'm not sure if you'll have to double check. Okay. It's a good question. Uh, okay, okay, yeah. So let's see what if I can find an answer, precise answer. Um, so to, to, to check complex. So complex is a computational tool. 
I'm, I'm telling you this just because I want to do a very specific computation, which is easy to do this. It's a classical computation in harsh form too. Um, so it's, it's the check complex, this starts with R and an element of R. And you consider this. So you're supposed to put a check over here. I haven't done it in the notes. So the check complex is, is of a single element is just this. So you take R, you localize, look at that. And so you would see that, uh, for example, the kernel up here has to do with element of R that are killed by powers of R. So this is already give you this torsion thing. So the zero, the homology here is, is telling you about R torsion. And the cold kernel was not the homology. So, so you take that, uh, and that's the check complex of an element. If, if you have a whole bunch of elements, this is just me being lazy and I wanted to write down what this is. But okay, so you want to define this too. And in certain way you do it inductively, well, or what you do is that you take a huge tensor product of individual complexes. Have you seen how to take the tensor product of a complex? Okay. Um, well, if not, look it up. Uh, uh, so <laughs> in, in practice, it's gonna it's gonna be this. So okay, let, let me write it down explicitly. Uh, so so yeah. So there is a general way to take the tensor product of complexes, and, and this is this is conceptual because it tells you that all you have to do, all you have to know is this, and then you write the general one. But in principle, it's just this. So you start with R, and then you take a big direct sum of all things in degree one, which is this thing. So you have to take R, and you can you have to localize it. So you go from one equals one to n, and and then like the next step is you take another direct sum. But then here you have to take the tensor product of two individual things. But uh, taking the tensor product, for example, of R localized at R1 and R localized at R2, you just R localized at R1 or 2. So in this spot, you're going to have uh, localizations by the products of two given elements like that. I guess I should put IJ, and you should have here I less than J. Who knows how many elements? Uh, two uh, and just two. Exactly, and you continue like that. Um, and then in the next step, you take all the ten so the point is that you're taking the tensor product here of something that is very short. So otherwise you have to take more things. But in, in the next step, you're gonna have to take the tensor product of all possible three things. Uh, and so you have the rest sum, i less than j, less than k, r, r i, r j, r k is this localization of that. Mm -hmm. Um, and also, you see, geometrically speaking, what this is sort of telling you, right? Because this is this is taking a principal open. This is the intersection of two principal opens. This is the intersection of three principal opens, mm -hmm. and so on. And you do it all this until you get to the product of all of them. And that's the last one. And that's the complex. Well, of course, I haven't told you the maps, but the maps are certain differential things. Uh, that you have to remind me what it is. Uh, well, this one is obvious. This is just R. R needs a map to every single one, so it's just a map. But then here you have to do, you have to twist by a negative. Who remembers how it works? Like if you have an element here, you see, like I can go and localize it uh, at every single one, but then I have to do an alternative sum. You remember, Mary? No. But it was written down in your face. Right? <laughs> uh, go ahead and look at uh, there is a there is a differential that you have to write down. Uh, it's 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 just so you have to you, you send it to every single one, right? but you have to do it in certain alternate ways. Um, so yeah, I guess I will put in another little differential, I guess. Um, but you can look it up, it's it's super famous. But that shows you how little I compute these things. <laughs> but, <laughs> So the way to compute this is that, and so, and so the point is that this is this complex. 
Uh, and if you tensor this with M, that's supposed to give you, by definition, a check complex of M with respect to these elements. OK? Um, So, and the theorem is that the cohomology of this check complex is local cohomology. And that's, that's actually how you compute it. So, the theorem, which is, 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 is not easy, but it's not super hard either, is that the local cohomology of the ideal generated by these things. Uh, is the i cohomology of the check complex. Yeah. Let me use more the index notation just to make room here. Okay. These two things are the same. Uh, but the definition, the, so the good thing is this, and this just tells you how to compute it. That's the way you think about it. Um, and all they want you to do actually with this is to do the following example. I put it here as an exercise. I think this is the only local cohomology computation I want you to do for now. Is that if you take R, the point number of ring, and M, the maximal ideal, let's say, then you can do, you can compute the local cohomology of R in here. So the idea is like this is the only computation you ever have to do, and then you use like a theory to deduce all the properties. So this thing here is very simple actually. This is zero if I is different from N, the dimension of the ring. So all the homology vanishes except one, which is HD. And what do you think you get? What would be the most surprising thing to find there? <laughs> it's something we have seen. Yeah, it's, the same. <laughs> mm. it, it's, it's a very specific thing here. We have written it down. It was a huge other song. Rejecting all of the particular people. OK? The, the big thing, the big direct sum of, monomi of monomials over K. You remember? And all of them positive. Where did you think I get it versus a uh, probably residue from? From there. <laughs> I, I knew it had to be that. So that is very explicit. So you get it from there. So, so that's that's where things start to make a connection here. So the local uh, homology module, the, the degree of it, it's the degree of the objective. Uh, the degree? Yeah, the i. The hour. So this this so I'm, I'm telling you what this is for every single i. If i is different from n, then it's zero. If i is equal to n. In other words, the top local homology, that's what we call it the top one, is the largest one, is injective all of the residue field for the point on the brain. Okay? And so a whole bunch of people just during the years look at that and say, hmm, that's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it looks very weird, but then the, the Gorenstein, the Gorenstein notion is, is just that. People say, you know what, that's orange and wait, sorry, that's wonderful. I wish everything were like that. And let's say let, they name it orange ring. Whenever that happens, that's a orange ring. Right. <laughs> um, because it's wonderful. So actually, there is so much into it, you know, like the, the, this is a very important calculation to do. Please do it, like, uh, and feel proud of yourself. <laughs> uh, so, for example, this is telling you about the cohomology of the project space and, and a whole bunch of things. This thing tells you that the A variant of the polynomial ring is N because there's a gradient going on here and so on. So, 
it's, it's, it's great. It tells you a whole bunch of nice things. Um, I, I know, like, I know it's like, what, what is this supposed to tell me? But Matt is mysterious sometimes. Matt doesn't care about what does. So, it's, it's what it is, and it's wonderful. It's, 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 it's great. Um, okay, so, right, like, uh, and of course, right, this also applies, well, no, I don't think it is, of course, but in principle, well, we'll see that from this, it does follow what this is when you put uh, power shoes here. Look at the homology, it doesn't care about it. As the injective whole, you know, doesn't care either because they're related. Um, okay, so this is a computation I think you should try to do. Um, okay. Is there any way to get that through? Remember, like, the first class, we told us that you have a regular sequence, then the x are equal, like, the x of some certain, like, you know, you get the uh, xk, xk, the model uh, equals zero if it's the, uh -huh. the index is less than the length of the regular sequence, and it's on if it's equal to the, yeah, and then you seem like. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's related. Uh, it's related. Uh, so we'll see that later. So, so we were doing that to make an interpretation of that in terms of x, and uh, we're going to make an interpretation of of that in terms of local homology. And uh, yeah, these are related. So the point is actually that the check complex is certain limit of Kutsul complexes. Which I would have loved to say, but we, we never talk about the two complexes properly. So, uh, but that relationship between check and the two let you see the, the relationship between these two computations actually. So, that, yeah, they are totally related in a very no, not, not obscure way, but a rather obscure way. So yeah, they are related through Kotsu cohomology and check complexes and so on. Um, and we'll see a specific manifestation of that, which is the computation of data in terms of, of this of these guys. Uh, and yeah, you're right. I, I think that's what you're saying, right? Like uh, the vanishing of this is to match the vanishing of certain X groups. Yeah. Okay. Totally. Um, so uh, yeah, so what I want to say now is that this, this. So you look, this is the polynomial ring, it holds for power series ring, and, you, and we know that those are, you know, the, 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 the beauty standard in the body, right? Uh, the polynomial ring is supposed to be the very best ring of power series ring. And so they have this property, which is amazing. We see why. And we, we want to have this property as much as possible. And so we name it correlation. Okay, that's what we're going to. Um, Actually, coming back to this phenomenon here, and this is a, this is an extra remark that I left as an exercise. Uh, it's like this thing here that you see that it seems like the local cohomology of the polynomial ring is, ex is the exact same thing as the local cohomology of the power series ring, and that's true. Yeah, and that's why it's called local cohomology. <laughs> you know, it's because it is, you're like you have the you have this this polynomial ring, and you compute the local cohomology at that point. That's that's the geometric picture. You have the affine space a n. You have the origin and you're computing cohomology around the point. But this tells you that it's the same thing if you do it on an arbitrarily small neighborhood around the point. That's because it is very local. So it's a local thing. It's local cohomology. Okay. So more precisely, uh, we have some, some properties that I'm gonna be using a lot actually. I, I put I put them here as an exercise. And this, this, is, this is not so hard. Actually, you can prove it either using the description or using the check compass. Yeah. You can use either one, and, and, and this is going to follow from that. Uh, so what is, what is the, the properties here? Uh, so we're going to take um, you know, the usual thing. Let's just take an ideal. Let's take M and our module. Um, and now the new ingredient is that we're going to take an algebra. And let's take n to be an S module. So, first of all, uh, 
there is a canonical isomorphism here. And write it down like this. So you can compute a local cohomology module over R, and you can do a base change. And that gives you actually a canonical isomorphism to, to here. Uh, I guess we can take S, A, and we can extend it. And we can extend M2. OK? And so you want this to be an isomorphism. You want this to be an isomorphism. Uh, let, let me let me let me put it more specifically. You can, you may want to take a pullback of, of, of the local cohomology model here and here. Um, and this is certainly a type of pullback, right? Because this represents the inverse image of the closed subset of A. And uh, yeah, so but let's say you want to put the full back of MP, right? And you want these two things to commute. You want local homology to commute with full back. And in principle, you can always expect a commutativity like that if the functor you're putting here has no homology. It's exact. When is that exact? When the algebra is flat, when S is flat. Pullback is exact when S over R is flat. So when the pullback has no, com no cohomology associated to it, you can just commute them. Other otherwise, there is some spectral sequence telling you how to compute the whole thing in terms of the cohomology of F, which of course is a whole bunch of pores. And but if it is flat, then they commute. So this is an isomorphism. If uh, theta is flat, in other words, it has no cohomology. Okay, so cohomology can be with base change with, with, with flat base change. And that's the only reasonable expectation if, if there is no cohomology involved. Uh, probably the same thing holds with the buffer trick, but I didn't write down, I don't think we're going to use it. Um, so the next point has to do with uh, restriction. This one is used a lot. Actually, um, now suppose that you want to commute to compute. Look, n is an S module, so suppose that you want to compute this local cohomology as an R module. So this is literally uh, the same thing as the restriction of the scalars of A I S. Okay, so, so here I'm commuting push forward with local cohomology. And that's fine, I don't need any hypothesis because push forward has no cohomology, it's an exact functor. So in general, cohomology commutes with exact functors. Um, so you can do that as an exercise. And we're going to apply this to guess who? For beams. Right, whenever you see a push forward by something from here, okay. Um, and actually, putting two things together, uh, you would see that the better hypothesis if R is local and M is finally generated, uh, then you get to see that. If you want to compute this local cohomology, this is the exact same thing as computed as computed in the completion. That's what I was saying that this is actually local. Very, very local. If you decimal be local. <laughs> okay. So this optic it's computed around and really tiny, tiny neighborhoods around. The closed point represented by M. Okay. Um, so in particular, this also tells you, you know, like these objects is actually an R hat module automatically. It's, it's that it's, it's that R hat module. Uh, it's the same thing as with injective pole. So this is what I was saying, like it, it generalizes this thing we're saying here. Um, 
Okay. Um, I think that's all we need to know about local homology in general. We saw the list of the right the right functor is essentially some sort of text. Um, we saw the check complex that if for some reason we need to compute something we can use. Uh, we saw the, the its properties here with respect to push forward, pull back, completion. And so that's it really. I don't think we need much more for now. Uh, now, the good thing about it is this is gonna tell us what Kohen Macaulay and Gorge and Rings are. Okay. Any questions so far? Is it uh, okay? Okay, okay, okay. Um. Now let's come back to Pedro's comment about the So exercise, here, let's put it as a property, well, exercise. But I hope you get to do. So if you have this hypothesis, actually before, uh, well, we saw this more or less, maybe in a particular case, but we saw that the depth of M with respect to A, a remember that this is the, the length of a regular sequence of M, the elements inside A. We saw that this was a minimum I in M. The hypothesis here is to ensure that this minimum is not empty, sorry, that this set is not empty. So the minimum I is like that X of R modulo A, comma, comma uh, uh, m i r is not zero. Right? That's a that's a way to understand what the depth is. You look at x i r modulo a m, right? I think class we did it, but uh, probably with the in a local case with the residue field here. Yeah, yeah. but it generalizes to that. Uh, and so now the, 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 the exercise is that this is also equal to the minimum. I always have a hard time writing this on the minimum i in M such that the local homology module uh, M is different from zero. And so what does that mean? So the point is that you start looking at uh, this local cohomology modules M, one M, H A two M. And so if you're lucky, you're gonna start, you're gonna start to see that this is zero, right? You have that this is zero, for example, if M has no torsion, which is a good thing to have, right? If M is supported everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you say, okay, let me move to the next one. And actually, this one is it's gonna tell you something about, if this is zero, it's gonna tell you something about the minimal primes, that there are no embedded primes uh, in certain ways. So that's a good thing if this is zero and so on. You want to keep going. So you want them to be zero. If they're zero, is a good thing. In general, cohomology tells you about obstructions to do things you want to do. So the more of them are zero, the better. So you wanna continue like that? And at some point, you know, you're going to have a h a uh, well, d minus 1 m is 0, but the next one is not. And when that happens, that's the depth. OK? Um, that's the so-called homological interpretation of depth. Uh, and so I think Pedro was asking, right? Like, what is the relationship between this X and this local cohomology? Well, it's, it's kind of it's direct, right, right? Because this one is computed in terms of limits of this, this sort of ones. Mm -hmm. um, 
But yeah, so uh, let me let me do more something else. So um. Actually, you need to have another generator for this too. Rivet. Um, in particular, this is the conclusion I want to write down. Um, R is Kohe Macaulay, if and only if. This local cosmology modules here are zero. Um, well, for all i uh, in between zero and the dimension of r minus one, right? That's what it means that the depth of r is equal to the dimension of r. Uh, and all p in spec of. Okay. Actually, this definition is, is useful because it also could let you see that the Cosmo call is really a local property. Okay. Uh, well, we would define it like that, but so yeah, you, you have this. So Kohama Cole means that when you look at the homology of your ring at every point, it vanishes. For all i equals zero to the dimension of r minus one. In particular, I suppose r has to have finite dimension. Oh no, because oh, no, it should be height of p, sorry, height. Because the height of p is the dimension of r minus p. Eh, sorry, r of p. Okay. Um, okay. That's that's the way to think about Kohemakovi that is where that we're gonna all use all the time. So we have this first definition just of a regular sequence, right? Like Kohemakovi means that every local ring, uh, every every system of parameters is a regular sequence. Uh, that's perhaps a conceptual way to think about it, but then there is this homological way to do it. It's just a vanishing of these local homology modules. Okay. Um, have you seen this before? This this definition of Kohima uh, yeah. Well, or characterization. I mean, not that one, but the one. I mean, the using the yeah the with local homology, and I think it's like very clear from that. Yeah, like, from the depth and equality and dimension of the definition of Kohima Kali that is yeah must be equal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, if, if you have this cosmological interpretation of that, then it follows it, and it is this. Um, so this is my favorite way to, to think about local cosmology. Uh, it's just that vanishing, and that's how we're going to use it. Um, so, ah, you can you can replace it by uh, the maximal ideal, so it, it can be checked with maximal ideals only, and so on. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, we we can do the local case. Uh, so, actually, I don't I don't I haven't said that yet. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Let, let me make this remark. And then also have some remark, but that, uh, 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 it's not clear to me when exactly we're going to do it. Uh, but uh, it's uh, yeah, we, we, we'll get to that. So let me let me say this. So if you if you have a local ring, let me do the local case. Okay, local. So it turns out that. 
this this cohomology modulus R zero for all e bigger than dimension. Okay, and actually this this is something this one yes this this will we're gonna say that this is the case H and D R is different from zero. Where D is the dimension, okay, D dimensional part. This is a general thing. And this one often goes by the name of Grothendieck vanishing, but the local cohomology vanishes after the dimension. If the ring doesn't have a big dimension, it can have a lot of local cohomology. So this is great. And this is Grothendieck non vanishing. That's a, the name should be put on it. This is why this is called the top local cohomology. Okay, so HDMR is called the top local cohomology, and for a cohomology ring, this is the only one that is non zero. So you can think of a cohomology local ring as a ring for which all cohomologies are zero except the top one, which is never zero, anyways. And we'll see why. Local duality. Uh, and now we are ready to define Gorgian ring. Uh, Well, it's this. I want to erase it. So, uh, definition. I'm so happy that we got to define this. <laughs> and just today, it's great. R is Gorenstein. If it is cosmopolitan, and in particular, the theorem. Remember, everything is the theorem. Here. R is Gorenstein. If two things, uh, this is R is cohomology. That's the first thing. By definition, a coherent ring is cohomology. The coherent condition only makes sense for cohomology rings. And when you look at H P pi to P, and now here I'm talking about the top local cohomology. At, at around P, at R module P, at R localized P. Okay? I'm looking at this, and what I'm going to ask for is that, that this is an injective call of the resonant field. So, what is the notation? Our P, I guess. Kappa P is the resonant field of P. And that's it. Therefore, the polynomial ring is Gorenstein by definition. Because if you compute the local cohomology of the polynomial ring, you just get that. So what is it? What is the thing? A Gorenstein ring is one that cohomologically speaking is identical to a regular ring. That's it. There is no computation cohomology to speak in that you can do to tell a Gorenstein ring from a polynomial ring. That's a Gorenstein ring is a ring that has the same cohomology, so to speak, than a, as, as a regular ring. I would name for have been say that a Gorenstein ring is cohomologically regular. Okay, but. Gorenstein, I guess, is talk better or whatever, I know. <laughs> um, so that's it. Um, and uh, I guess we don't have more time. And uh, you may be wondering, OK, yeah, that's, that's great. But these are rings that, uh, for which I have to compute the local homology quite well. Or in another template, they, they, these are rings for which I have a good understanding of what the people of the rest of the field are, right? And so what is this good for? So we're going to see that on Thursday, and it's the glorious local dolly. Here, Gorenstein rings are those rings that, whose cohomology is good enough, cohomology of a real ring, there are no structures to write local dolly in a good way. Uh, in local duality, is uh, the Poincare duality of community algebra. And you know, Carre duality is, is the duality of geometry. And actually, there is one that's called Serre duality. 
That's the one of algebraic geometry. And the local contact part is local dualized. And so it cannot be underestimated how important it is. And that's going to be in first in local duality, how it relates to matrix duality. And by doing all the yoga dualities, <laughs> we could cut the Cartier operator. It, it's just it's just vomiting out of it in a natural way. Okay. So 